I'm very happy to see everyone here and not wearing pajamas. As I mentioned before, as a university professor, I like to teach my classes earlier in the day. And there's this amazing trend now where students actually come to class in pajamas. It's the most unbelievable thing in the world. But I think it's uh, interesting to look at that as an attitudinal change. You know, it is a difference in the way that people are moving into social places. It is a belief that there is a certain comfort or a certain expectation that behaviors um, are changing uh, within social environments. There is certainly a formality in the classroom that seems to be evaporating. Some people can say that's good. Some people say it's bad. It just sort of is, I deal with it and move along. But today, I'm not going to talk so much about pajamas, but talk a little bit about media and the use of technology and the use of mobile devices in physical locations. So just to back up ever so slightly, you know, in the beginning, media was just considered to be an auditory and a visual experience, okay? And it's all push, right? It's what you're showing if you want to use television or radio. As an early model, it was sort of what was being broadcast over whatever media or modality uh, you want to choose. As multimedia was introduced, there was an interaction or a tactileness that was included into that. A lot of examples of this would be sort of modern day kiosks that you would see um, in physical locations, um, and sort of the involvement, you know, where someone's actually touching something, but they're mostly still localized for the most part. And they're, most of the time, they're still narrative, i.e. there aren't big branching patterns. There aren't multiple ways in which people can actually change the experience. As we get into interactive media, the tactile part, the tactile part stays, the auditory part stays, and the visual part stays. But we get this other thing, which is the temporal, OK? Um, the temporal being you know, sort of a fancy word for time, and also if you want to get really abstract with it, time and space are sort of the same thing. Also location, but it's not a physics class, we're talking about interactive media. But this idea that you can get to these different experiences when you need to and in any location that you want to. And over time, there are all sorts of new words that are coming out. Intermedial is a word that's being thrown around. Transmedial is a word that's being thrown around. Remedial is probably the most accurate word we can think of in that we, when we contextualize our experiences, um, I find as a designer and as a developer, as an educator, that we are mapping a lot of the traditional techniques that we all know as creatives um, to this process in the mobile environment as well. So what, what types of things are we talking about? Well. We're talking about specific design patterns. We're talking about specific use patterns. Like the idea is, what is the expectation for someone when they come into, the, come into a physical space or when they're using a device as to what is acceptable or what the transaction is going to be? A lot of what I end up doing is looking at creating experiences that are located in specific physical spaces. So like my history, was originally it's just like a narrative guy. Like when I, when I first started, I was making films, I was making music videos, and I'd always done interactive work and I'd been involved in the web. But for me personally, what's been really exciting is looking at mobile computing and the devices within the context of actual experiences. So what I've been thinking about is how do I really keep all those great design patterns that I knew about earlier. You know, like what, what makes a great experience for someone? How is it engaging? And then how do I sort of adapt with the technology as it's been created? Now, there's tons of information out there about like what's acceptable behavior. And certainly with texting, um, it's, it's definitely the predominant form of mobile communication that you'll find in the industry today for a variety of reasons. We're going to talk about that a little bit more. But the use of the mobile device in the physical space has definitely changed. Yeah, I was wondering if you guys actually enjoy treating your customers like pieces of <laughs> Because that's how I felt when I went to the Alamo Draft House, OK? You know what? I didn't know that I was supposed to text in your little crappy theater. It was too 
start in that place for me to find my seat, all right? I'll use my phone as a flashlight and get to my fucking seat. So excuse me for using my phone in USA, the United States of America, where you are free to text in a theater. I was not aware that I could text in your theater, all right? I've texted in all the other theaters in Austin, and no one ever gave a about what he, I was doing my phone, all right? And it was silent. It wasn't on loud. It wasn't bothering anybody. You guys, obviously, were being with me, and I'm sure that's what you do, you know, to rip people off, you take my money, and then you throw me out. You know, I will never be coming back to your Alamo draft house or whatever. I'd rather go to a regular theater where people are actually polite. And, it, you know, I'm going to tell everyone about how you are. And I'm pretty sure you guys will be a couple of person. So thanks for making me feel like a customer. Thanks for taking my money, asshole. So, you know, the reactions about how we're using mobile devices in public spaces is rather dynamic. That first slide that I showed you was if you text, you die, okay, you get into a car wreck. This example is if you text, we just sort of boot you out. But what I'm really interested in is how can I get you to text and it be okay and acceptable and encourage that type of participation? And all of these interactions are based upon this thing known as the social contract. So there's this French philosopher who sort of put this idea out there originally. A lot of philosophers have written about this. But it's this idea of the collective ruling. Like we enter into spaces and we enter into arrangements with a belief as to what a, an appropriate behavior should or shouldn't be. And it's the manipulation of this social contract that is really the context of what's going to make a, an effective mobile experience. And a lot of the things that we've designed and that we've created are based upon really informing our audiences as to what our expectations are for acceptable behavior. And setting expectations is extremely important in any learning environment. It's important in any business environment. It's important, it, you know what? It's important in your family environment because how many people want or would expect to be with a loved one in a conversation and then having them interrupt that conversation with a cell phone? Like there, isn't, there may be an expectation within your relationships that that's okay. Maybe you're a physician and the idea is that you're on call. Within the context of that relationship, if you would pick up your phone, it's obviously something that's warranted. And another interaction, you know, a very simple one that I could give as an example, you know, Chad was talking about how, how often we sort of check our phones. You know, I have to learn how to moderate my behavior with the people that I'm interacting with to make sure that they know that they are important within the context of my communication with them. And I'd say one of the things that I have the most difficulty with, in all honesty, is my relationships with my child, with my daughter, who is seven. And Adeline lives in this world. You know, she understands the idea of mobile communication. She has her own iPad. She has her own iPod. She uses it on demand. You know, I do some things to restrict her access. But, you know, the, the nature of our interactions with each other um, really have shown that, you know, we do accept certain parts of that, but then there are other parts when we have to say, okay, we're putting this device away because this is not an acceptable interaction while we're having dinner or while we have guests over at our home or even if she has friends that have come over to the house because that introduces another dynamic when you're bringing someone else into the environment that might be operating with a different rule set or a different expectation. So this idea of sort of the social contract and laying the understanding of what the experience is going to be is extremely important when you think about bringing the device into the physical space because you're expecting some people to perhaps transcend a set of behaviors that they are not particularly comfortable with or would not think are socially acceptable. So one of the things about the use of mobile devices 
and how we engage our audiences with mobile devices is this, is this idea of what is experiential versus what is related to a lifestyle. And the experiential is the part that I think a lot of us get. We really understand what it means to have a great experience. If we go and see a film that engages us, if we go to a conference that has wonderful content, if we play a game on our phone or on our tablet that we enjoy to time slice with three to five minutes at a time and we can get that little bit of angry birds in you know, between the next phone call or while people are coming into the conference room, that is an experience that is pleasurable. But for things to have longevity and impact, the second part is even more crucial, which is lifestyle. When we begin to craft our mobile experiences, we really need to think about the lifestyles of the users. One of the most interesting campaigns that I saw in the last year was one that was created um, along with the publication of Jay-Z's book called Decode. Jay-Z is a very famous rapper. Um, you may also know that he is a very successful business person. He represents multiple brands. He's an owner in Rockefeller Records. He has some interest in sports arenas. He owns clubs. But he embodies a specific lifestyle. And this campaign was centered around the publication of this text. And with Jay-Z's last album, one of the things that was extremely important to him was the injection of um, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, sort of wordplay and word imagery that was not typical to a rap audience. You know, he made a lot of uh, contextual allusions to Illuminati um, and some other social issues. And the release of this entire campaign was to hopefully support the evolution of his lifestyle. And I think it's important to think about lifestyle as being radically different from brand, okay? Because brand is the, the concept of, you know, how do you represent a company's specific attributes? And if you talk to anyone that works in industry, you'll get 100 different definitions of what brand actually is. And, you know, branding is a term that's really only come into existence in, in sort of common language and common use in the last decade. You know, we didn't, we, we talked about corporate image a lot, but we didn't talk about brand. And this concept of brand has now extended beyond the company to the individual. In fact, when we counsel our students that are coming up through the program, we begin talking to them at the freshman level about how are they cultivating their brand? How are they representing themselves in the marketplace? What are they doing within the digital space to explain how they're going to be a competitive asset to someone that might want to hire them. So sometimes I think a way to think about it is brand is often about, is also about push. Like when I talked about that media aspect, it is about pushing the different brand attributes, the things that differentiate you from everyone else. Lifestyle, I think, is more about the absorption of brand and getting to create a mobile experience that sort of extends to an individual's lifestyle begins to speak to how they are going to integrate it for themselves. So, like, what do we see up here? You know, can you guys kind of make out, like, what do we have in this image? We got sort of a Jacob the Jeweler, you know, blinged out Rolexes shown here. And the actual text, the, the idea with this campaign was that for, I, I don't remember how many days it was, but there was approximately 350 physical manifestations of parts of his book that were cross-tied to a search um, application that was created in Bing. And the idea was that people would go out and geotag these individual pieces of the book, and then they would be able to post that up to a centralized website, and then they would get to own that piece of content. So every day, so many pieces were released, and there were clues that were being pushed out. And uh, if you get a chance, you might want to check it out, because it was a very innovative campaign, um, and, it, and it had time, scope, and scale. 